Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters, welcome back to a fantastic episode. This is the 200th episode of America Adapts. I wanted to do something special, and this episode is. I've partnered with the U.S. Department of Defense, and we're highlighting some of the innovative work they're doing in adaptation research. I am honored to be working with DOD, and what better way to celebrate the 200th episode of America Adapts? We both use red, white, and blue as our theme colors. This is my second episode partnering with DOD. Late last year, I attended the Department of Defense Energy and Environment Innovation Symposium in Washington, D.C. In this episode, we'll hear from the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, or CERTUP, at DOD. It's a program that focuses on innovation and research, and they are the ones who hosted the symposium. I'll talk to senior leadership within the programs and people attending the event doing really important and interesting resilience research. It was a huge event. You'll hear how the DOD is interacting with partners and providing resilience research for military installations. You'll hear things about surprise events and eDNA, and that's just scratching the surface of the type of research that they do there. You'll also go behind the scenes and what it means to take a research idea idea, fund it, and see it through for in-the-field applications. It's not easy, and CERTUP is looking for ways to quicken that process. You'll hear from university researchers, DOD staff, policy experts, and those working in the field. We cover a lot of ground in this episode. They're focusing more on resilience within CERTUP, and I was there to cover it. I did an episode with Department of Defense last summer, but that focused more on policy, and we're talking with the research arm of the DOD. I hope you enjoy these conversations as much as I did. Kicking it off is Dr. Kimberly Spangler, the executive director of the CERTUP program. There are a lot of acronyms in this episode, and I do my best to try to explain them, but for the sake of brevity, we use the acronyms quite often. And as I noted earlier, this is the 200th episode of America Daps. It's an important milestone for me. I'll have more things to say at the end of the episode, so stick around for that. Okay, let's kick things off with Dr. Kimberly Spangler of CERTUP. Hey, Adapters. Joining me is Dr. Kimberly Spangler. Kim is the Executive Director for CERTUP and ESTCP at the Department of Defense. Hi, Kim. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug. Thanks for having me. Let's just get it out of the way. What do those acronyms stand for? So CERTUP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, and ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program. We are here pre-conference, and I want to ground folks on what you guys are all about. And then you're going to come back on at the very end, and we're going to talk about the conference and more about the work that you do there. But just broadly, what's the primary mission there with your programs? So CERTUP and ESTCP have a broad and diverse portfolio. We address the top priority issues for the Department of Defense from installation energy and all the environmental challenges. You can imagine DOD is a very large organization, and there are quite a few energy and environment challenges that we take on within that space. This might not be that easy, but how does it fit within the broader Department of Defense? I think a lot of people just think of this huge department. How do you guys plug in there? So it is a huge department, and we are the department-level investment in research and development for energy and environment. We are setting the technical direction for the Department of Defense for the technical term is research, development, test, and engine and evaluation. But we're setting the technical direction for the department. We work with and coordinate with the services, but our ultimate goal is to be on that leading edge of energy and environment work so that it can be matured and then ultimately transitioned out to the field as rapidly as possible. And you report directly to who? So I report directly to the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Environment and Energy Resilience within the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy Installations and Environment. Let's talk about the symposium. It's going to be in D.C. I always love getting to D.C. I used to live there. Tell us a little bit of the history of the symposium. The symposium has been going on for decades. It is an event where we bring all the folks together who we fund with CERTUP and ESTCP projects. And we also bring in stakeholders, colleagues, peers from around the national and international community to have a scientific conference. Now, in recent years, we've actually partnered with our operational energy innovation counterparts, 
That has been amazing. This will be our second year doing that. We've then really brought in the entirety of the Department of Defense innovation work for energy and environment. Tell us a bit about some of those themes, though, because part of the reason that I'm going to this event is that resilience is a, a major theme and it hasn't always been, right? Correct. So, well, so since 2009, CERTIP and ESTCP have been responding to requests from the department level on climate resilience. That has really ramped up over the last several years, especially given direction from the administration and Congress. And you'll see that this year at the conference, how our investments are really playing out and how those technologies have been maturing. Can you just give us a really broad overview of some of the ongoing or even recent projects that your office deals with? Definitely. So in the area of adaptation, we've been working a lot on our new initiative, which is the National Innovations Landscape Network. I'm super excited about that initiative. I would love for you to be able to attend some of those sessions. But the bottom line is that we are working hand in hand with installation managers to test out our innovations in real time for regional aspects of the country and at different installations. And by working so closely with those installation managers, we are actually coming up with new ideas on the fly that we can put into place. Working on things like wildland fire, working on things like coastal sea level rise, working on things like permafrost degradation, working on things like desertification for our installations in the West. We have a lot of great projects on that and a lot of posters and technical presentations and also policy discussions that will be featured at the symposium. Now, I attended and did an episode around the climate resilience workshop that occurred in St. Louis in the middle of the summer. How are you guys related to that? Yes. So listen to your podcast on that. That was a great podcast. Able to hear from a lot of my colleagues there. So we are the counterpart conference to that event that happened during the summer. And what's really unique about CERTIP and also the operational energy innovation programs is that we work hand in hand with the policy teams. So what you saw over the summer was primarily a policy focused conference that had innovation aspects of it. What we have here in November is an innovation focused conference with policy aspects also being featured. The key is that if we're going to make real change for climate adaptation, we need to be sure that we are integrating innovative work with the requisite policy. Can you give my listeners a preview of some of the keynote speakers? And it didn't even have to be the, the resilience-focused speakers, but just folks that you've recruited to come to the, the conference. It looks like a, a blockbuster in that respect. Yes. So we have some very high-level folks that are either current or former senior leaders within the Department of Defense. We'll have DASD acting Mr. Michael McGee will be giving what we're considering the state of the union of DOD innovation. We'll also have Ms. Sharon Burke will be giving a plenary talk. She's the former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Operational Energy. Major General Constance Jenkins will be there from NORAD. And then in some of our sessions, we'll also have former assistant secretary level folks. Now, it is great to have the support of current and former senior leadership. I'd also like to offer that this is the first year at the conference that we'll be having exemplar projects that we'll be briefing at our breakfast sessions. And what's great about that is that the entirety of the attendees of the conference will be able to see the breadth and the scope of the work that CERTIP, ESTCP, and the OE Operational Energy Innovation Programs are doing. We'll see presentations by folks in their very early career, I believe some folks are first-year professors, all the way through people that are just really preeminent in their field. So I think it'll be really great just to see that breadth and scope. And also to mention that where we do see a lot of innovation is exposure. And so if we can have folks in perhaps our climate space that are being exposed to the type of work that we're doing in our operational energy space, being exposed to the type of work we're doing for remediating underwater unexploded ordnance, there's opportunity there for really dynamic innovation. Fantastic. So we're going to get you back on at the end of the episode, and we're going to dig in a bit further and what happened at the conference and more about your program. But I will see you in DC and I'll talk to you soon. Yes, looking forward to it. Hey, adopters, I'm back and I'm with Aaron Looney. 
I'm from MIT Lincoln Laboratory, where we're building up our climate resilience portfolio and starting here with our connection with ESTCP's new climate resilience program, Folio. So you're working with CERT up here. Tell me a bit about that relationship. Sure. So I'm on the technical committee, which is the group of people that work to understand the proposals that come in, make statements of need for their portfolio and help set direction for new statements of need in the future. We also do side analyses sometimes, which I gave a talk on here at this conference. Okay, tell me a bit about your role here at the conference. Sure. I helped chair a session with the DOD to understand how climate resilience is impacting their critical infrastructure. I also gave a little bit of an insight into the analysis I've been doing on the budget breakdown for the DOD fiscal year 2023. I took a look at the adaptation budget as well as the mitigation budget, which are both parts of climate resilience, to understand how much is being funded in both areas and how ESTCP is critical to the adaptation piece of that, which is really important for DOD missions. Tell us a bit about that relationship in regards to that you're helping them set resilience policy and it's kind of informing what they're doing here at the conference. Give us a bit about that. Sure. So we're always thinking about how DOD missions can be more resilient. As a part of that is adaptation. So mitigation is one part of that. That's where you take greenhouse gas emissions away from the atmosphere. You do carbon sequestration for material building materials and a bunch of other things that are mitigation related, including renewable energy. But there's also adaptation where you take measures to withstand the impacts of climate change. And that's really important for uh, emission resilience and our installations and the surrounding communities. So a big thing that ESCCP does in three key areas is understand how we can make our DOD missions more resilient by adapting them to the future climate. And those three areas include our large premier tools like DCAT, the which is the Defense Climate Assessment Tool, or DERSL, which is the Defense Sea Level Rise Tool. So we can understand how the large-scale climate will be impacted. But we also look at key geographies like the Arctic, which is greatly impacted, the Southwest, which will be greatly impacted with droughts, wildfires, et cetera. And we also look at the Southeast and other areas in CONUS. So we help them set direction in how to do the best RDT&E, which is research, demonstration, test, and evaluation, to uh, help all of those efforts. Okay, tell me a bit about the session. Not necessarily all the speakers, but what were you hoping to accomplish? What key messages were you trying to get out? One thing I found in my analysis that I thought was really interesting was the DOD is heavily investing in mitigation, which is something that other areas of the federal government are really interested in, the DOD, DOE, et cetera. Mitigation is super important, It's about, but about 90% of the budget was put into mitigation efforts for RDT&E, and only 10% was put towards adaptation. And ESTCP's program holds up about 30% of that, which means it's vital to the RDT&E for adaptation for the DoD. And that part of the budget is held up with all of the programs that were on display this week and that we're continuing to try to help the DoD with, basically. So within that session, we had several different speakers, some very experienced ESTCP speakers, some less experienced, including Tom Douglas, who works in the Arctic for many years. He works on permafrost. We also had Michelle Michaels, who talked about the Alaska Innovation Landscape Network, which is a part of a new program that ESTCP is putting forward called the National Innovation Landscape Network, where we're trying to really bridge the valley of death so we can get our R&D into the field as quickly as possible with rapid cycles of iteration. So those were two. We have others, including Peter Larson, who works uh, at uh, Berkeley National Laboratory. He takes a system that's already in place, which is called Builder within the DoD, and takes back-end models to understand the economic impacts of climate change on components within each DoD building to understand when we're going to have to replace them quicker and understand all of the economic fallout of that. And there are several other speakers on hydrology from the University of Delaware with Carolyn Voter. Another speaker was Dan Feldman from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. He was speaking about downscaling of global circulation models into a regional or local level so it can be used by an installation or a DoD installation or a community around that installation. That's a community that has a bunch of experts from all across the board, and he's really bringing together a community of practice around that area of science in a way that's never been done before. So that was really exciting to see. 
you gave a presentation. What was the title of the presentation and what were you trying to share in that? Sure. It was kind of an intro to the entire topic of critical infrastructure for the DOD and climate resilience for that critical infrastructure. And the point of that talk was to really get across how ESTCP is playing a vital role in this space for three main ways. One is that it's aligning itself with two of the climate adaptation plans priorities. One is climate informed decision making, and the other is resilient built in natural infrastructure. And it's the premier RDT and E part of those two priorities of the DOD. So it's really playing a vital role in that area. It also has two other really unique features. One of its features is that it does 6-1, which is basic research, all the way through to demonstration and evaluation. So it's in the hands of practitioners out of DOD installations. And that's really the entire development pipeline, which is rare for any institution to support all of that. The third way it's really unique is that it brings in state-of-the-art climate science from all areas. So it takes research from the DOD, from other national labs, from academia, and from industry. So it takes from all of the best of climate science and brings it to our missions. And that's really unique. Okay. So I did an episode a while ago looking at all the federal agency adaptation action plans. And we looked at the Department of Defense. And I think on one of your slides, you had it up there as the various documents and reports and and strategic plans that are guiding the Department of Defense. So that adaptation action plan that came out in 2021, how does that guide down into the level of what CERTUP is doing? Sure. Yeah. So it's highly aligned. CERTUP ESTCP's climate resilience portfolio goes back and was anticipating the needs of the DOD way before the DOD knew it needed that. So that's really great for ESTCP to be anticipating those needs. All the way back in 2008, 2009, the first statements of need were put out by CERTIP and ESTCP to look at climate resilience for the DOD. And the DOD didn't put out anything until about 2013. So it was really revolutionary as leading the way in, in this area. So going forward from there in 2022, the climate resilience program was started. That was about over 10 years after they had first put out their first statement of need. and That was a year after the climate adaptation plans you were just talking about were released. And so it was highly aligned and the team works closely with the policy team that writes those reports to understand the RDT and E needs for all of those priorities. So I mentioned before there were five top priorities and the needs of ESTCP that are put out are directly aligned with those priorities in different ways for anywhere from the high level policy down to your key geography. It's a big issue within the adaptation sector of using the language of resilience versus adaptation. And so the Department of Defense had an adaptation action plan. Why wasn't it called a climate resilience plan? Because most of the time you're hearing DOD use the word resilience. Sure, that's a really great question. Definitions are really hard in this space. I have a graphic that has resilience built on top of mitigation and adaptation. Those are the two key founding stones to build resilience. Mitigation is the greenhouse gas portion, and then you have adaptation, which is what the plan was named. And adaptation is probably the preeminent part of DOD's plan. If you break down all of their sub-priorities, 13 of those are adaptation-related, and three of those are mitigation-related. So adaptation plays a large role in, I think, the DOD strategy, if you read their documents, and ESTCP primarily supports that with rdt e When you look at the DOD, they're doing a lot of ambitious things around adaptation and resilience. Do you see that they're interacting with other federal agencies? Some of them are farther behind, or is it just everyone's kind of doing their own thing? Is there that cross-agency integration? So we're talking about federal agencies. So the DOD definitely has its own climate action plan, and the executive order put forth a mandate for all federal agencies to put out climate action plans. If you read them, they're somewhat related, but I would say that they're pretty unique to the organization and the needs of those organizations. I think the DOD is a little bit different in that it's so mission focused. So everything that's done, whether mitigation or adaptation related, has to be to further the mission of the DOD. So we're here at this conference. Anything stand out for you? Sure. Yeah. I think it's the biggest amount of attendance that they've had at one of these conferences before. I think over 1,300 people are here, and that's great to see. I think there's a lot of interest. Both we have a new director of CERTIP and ESTCP, which has brought a lot of interest. We have people from outside of the community coming in, which is great for collaboration. And you have all of the projects, hundreds of projects here presenting posters and other R&D that both support the DOD and the surrounding communities, which represents millions of Americans. 
okay, for me, just being an outsider is a bit bewildering the amount of projects that it sort of funds and it's kind of exciting, but at the same time, how do they keep track of all this? Is that part of the process? And when you think about even the conference next year, are you able to identify gaps? Okay, this is what we're doing strong. Do you have that conversation like a month or two after this conference? Certainly, there's a lot of after action that happens after any of these conferences. Both reports come out, meetings happen, and it's really a way to strengthen those connections where people are all over the country. I specifically am at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, which is in Lexington, Massachusetts, but a lot of the people that I work with are in D.C., are in Georgia, are on the West Coast, or in the middle of the country. So it brings us all together. And after this, I think our ties are a lot stronger. So when we get together for our sometimes four times a year meetings, we have a one another conference in the summer, but we don't see each other often. So it's really a great way to connect. Did you have a favorite poster? A favorite poster? I really like Dan Eisenberg's poster on resilience. They have a a game where you can test resilience in a kind of a dystopian land. And so it's a game to understand how resilience is played out. And you can actually play the game and see how resilient you are and resourceful you are. Thanks for coming on the podcast. No problem. Hey, Adapters, I'm back and I'm with Dr. Daniel Eisenberg. Hey, Daniel, nice to meet you. How's it going? I have you on and you're the only person that I have on that is focused. The There's a poster that you did and I was really impressed with what you're doing there. So, you know, we're going to dig into that, but just at 30,000 foot level, what were you saying in that poster? So the work that we're doing for uh, the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program is trying to understand and adapt to environmental surprise. So this includes trying to think through new theory for how surprise affects our infrastructure systems for military installations and communities, as well as develop tools and games to try and train people to better understand and think through resilience problems as well as surprise. Okay. And I forgot to mention, where do you work? (laughs) Yeah. So I'm an assistant professor of operations research at the Naval Postgraduate School. I'm also the director for our Center for Infrastructure Defense. It's a a research group that's been at the university for many years. Operations research, for those who don't know, it's kind of anything you would think of for data analytics, optimization, data science kinds of stuff. We do all of that. The NPSOR department's like the oldest in the country and potentially the world. Started back in post-World War II, and we've been studying infrastructure, vulnerability, and resilience for a very long time. Okay, so I'll be honest, what really stood out for me on this poster, you weren't there at the time when I looked at the poster, and it was talked about, I think, some of this modeling that's happening, and that you highlighted that there's events that are just very regular and predictable if we're talking about rain. These are things that we know, but then there's these rare events, like maybe a hurricane or the, along those lines, but then you had this language, and please correct me that I just interpreted this wrong, you have surprise events, and now you are trying to help I guess the military here plan for those things that are just completely random and just haven't been thought about before. Is that a good way to sort of talk about what was in that poster? Sure. I wouldn't use random because it implies certain things in our statistics world. But so we try and distinguish in general, we're trying to deal with big, bad disasters, natural disasters, adversarial threats, things like that. Surprise can be thought of in a couple of different ways. From an infrastructure management perspective, we talk about three different states. One is like normal variation, which are events that you can kind of expect based off of normal maintenance and operations planning. Pipes will break, power lines will go down just from normal operations. Situational surprises are events that it's like playing the the lottery and winning. You know, it's like a rare event, but it's something that you could anticipate and it works within your model of how the world works, right? This is a, a major blackout and it was caused by a hurricane that just blew over and knocked over a bunch of power lines. Then there's these other events that we're trying to get a better handle on that we call fundamental surprises. This is really related to just us not even knowing things about the world that we're living, us not knowing things about the systems that we operate. So these disasters actually trigger new knowledge and new thinking and and create problems that we've never seen before. And the question is, can we try and adapt to those, right? At least theoretically speaking, we can try and even model and study situational surprise using techniques that have been well established over the years for mathematics. But whether we can model and study fundamental surprise is an open question. Do we have to experience the disaster <laughs> to really start dealing with it? Or can we try and train and adapt to it before they actually occur? 
One case study that we completed, which was on Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune after it was hit by Hurricane Florence, that was a major storm, but that region has experienced many major storms before. So it's like, why was this one so much worse? What happened during this event that was potentially a situational surprise or a fundamental surprise? We found that fundamental surprise really affected certain decision making, like with the reopening of schools and different base infrastructure because people just weren't thinking about the mold and other kinds of impacts that were going to occur, which hadn't occurred from previous disasters. And so they just completely overlook it. And the question is, we can now identify when fundamental surprise happens, what it looks like. Can we now get people to better adapt to them in situ, right, before they occur and ideally when the actual disaster is occurring? So I've been involved with scenario planning in a previous life. So would this be like a tool, fundamental surprises be sort of an aspect, because in a lot of that scenario planning, you do come up with these worst case scenarios. And is that just another, some language that you're trying to go with this fundamental surprise concept? In a sense. So actually techniques for assessing and identifying worst case scenarios to, at least in the mathematics and the things that we try and do, we have techniques that can figure those out for us to a certain extent. This is somewhat beyond this notion of worst case, right? It's it's trying to deal with the situations or the events that you just couldn't define a priori. And so in a certain context, you if you had, let's say, an infinite budget and you can name all your scenarios in some kind of established risk management program, you could make it so the hurricane just blows over and nothing happens. But it turns out there's parts of our infrastructure, whether it's our water systems, our power systems, our installations, that we just don't even know how they work or what they're doing. And so when the hurricane blows over, we just don't have that perfect information to act upon it. How do we build in adaptation and capabilities that allow us to reconsider and even transform and change the way that we're understanding the disaster as it unfolds, which is different from hardening our infrastructure or designing in a particular way to deal with the risks that we can identify. So a lot of agencies, they have triggers and policy triggers based on storm events. And I'm just thinking like this notion of fundamental surprise. They need permission to release funding based on metrics and such. And so do you see policy applications like, well, you now have this concept of fundamental surprise. It sort of it, it allows you to just bypass all these other things because it's such a radical and I'm using language that maybe statistically, like you said earlier, <laughs> is is off. Just excuse me. I never took stats that I'm trying to think of the applied applications of this concept, like embedding it within policy development. Yeah. So one application. Right. So the Camp Lejeune case study, for example, what we've essentially identified from a practical standpoint is situational surprises, practically speaking, are usually budget or resource limited. If you just had more money, more manpower, more equipment, you could likely deal with them because your decisions that you're making are solving the problem as you see it. Fundamental surprises do not get solved by just flooding the zone with more money. And so there are potential policy applications and or ways that we can have triggers where it's not just solve the problem in like the traditional emergency response, emergency management, let's just get a lot of money and resources to this location, but actually spend time and and realize that we need to adapt our models, adapt our understanding of the system before we start applying those resources. So the key idea here is to distinguish between Those events that if you were to just, you know, activate the congressional budget to support this disaster, you will manage it well versus you need to spend time and think of a new solution before providing those resources. In the fundamental surprise context, providing more money and and actually acting on it too quickly could make the disaster worse because you end up trying to fix things in ways that don't actually work. You end up wasting resources, potentially hurting people, causing more pain. Okay, I'm going to just push you a little bit further here, though. Can, can you give me like an agency or a process or an event where they're using this notion of fundamental surprise? It's it, You're applying it on the ground. Yeah, well, it's kind of new. So we have developed some training tools and we've been 
trying to get folks within the Naval Facilities Command, NAVFAC. So we're part of the Civil Engineering Corps Officer School, SECOS. We've been doing training with them, who are essentially all the public works officers who work for naval installations, to try and get them to at least understand these basic concepts. Currently, though, I wouldn't say notions of situational and fundamental surprise have been directly applied in policy, even though they could be. They're relatively new. This is CERDIP as a funding program is basic research, right? So this is like new concepts, even though their initial ideas are coming from like military intelligence community literature from back in the 60s and 70s. They've never been used in infrastructure, never been actually applied in emergency management explicitly. We're doing our best to develop trainings and work with the Navy. We've been doing work with DHS training programs related to FEMA and other folks were in the kind of broader DHS ecosystem, as well as we've done trainings with other militaries, foreign militaries, to just get these basic concepts there. So hopefully <laughs> in the near future, there's actually policy and or practical decision making like on the books that supports this kind of response. OK, so you're talking at the scale of military and these sort of partners. But a lot of my listeners, too, are local government people, urban planners, and I see Potential experimentation with this concept. Is, is your information available to the, let's say, people listening to this and they're like, I mean, is your poster and this whole concept? Because a lot of probably interesting work could be happening out there because people are looking for models outside the normal adaptation planning process. Yeah, I work for the Naval Postgraduate School, but we're not necessarily just talking about Navy infrastructure here. These theories apply to civilian systems as well. For example, we've been working closely with the University of the Virgin Islands and helping them develop their new hazard mitigation and resilience plan for the territory, which there is no military installation out there. It's just a bunch of communities on some small islands that have deal with really bad storms and hurricanes, droughts and disasters. And so they're trying to incorporate notions of surprise and surprise management in their hazard mitigation resilience plan, which is a actual policy that has to be on the books for FEMA to provide funding to the territory for the next disaster. So the things that I'm talking about, actually, we focus more on the military installation and even island scale. We've done work out in Hawaii. We have done work, like I mentioned, for various military installations like Camp Lejeune, Marine Corps Base Hawaii, places like that. We've worked in Rhode Island, Naval Station Newport. So these are all places embedded in communities or at the scale of communities, more so than militaries. Right. I'm actually doing less on the Pentagon level than I am doing at the local level. Has there been a highlight at the conference for you? The highlight of the conference for me? Well, you know, it's always exciting to get together with other folks that you know. I, I was pleasantly surprised with some of the other researchers that I know in the field that have come here. This year is actually, I would say, the biggest CERDIP ESTCP symposium I've been to. I think it's because they integrated with the OECIF and other offices. I don't even know these acronyms very well myself, so look them up, but various places in the Pentagon. And so it's been really interesting seeing just like kind of this groundswell of individuals that Last year, the rooms were partially full, and now they're spilling out the doors. So that's probably the nicest surprise to me. <laughs> the content is always good, and the people are always interesting. But just the fact that there's kind of a growing community is kind of exciting. If someone was really curious and they want to get in touch with you, what would you recommend? Well, you can go to our website, nps.edu slash CID, that's Center for Infrastructure Defense. You can reach out to me, daniel.eisenberg at nps.edu. I'm always interested in working on infrastructure management, surprise studies. And we have an online game that you can play. It's Disruption with a Y, D-Y-S, disruption.net. You can go check it out. And it's kind of like a basic version of what we've been using for our training. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Hey, Adapters, joining me is Kevin Hires. Kevin is the Climate Resilience Program Manager for SERDP and ESTCP. Hi, Kevin. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug. Thanks for having me on. All right. Great, Kevin. So before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that you and I actually go way back. We went to graduate school together at the University of Georgia in the ecology program there. And when we saw each other at the DOD conference in July, we knew each other, but we weren't quite sure how where it was because it had been so long. So it was amazing that we went that far back, right? Absolutely. We had to go do some consultations just to find the connections, but we finally did. Let's pivot a little bit here. First off, before we get into the conference, what is your role there as manager for the Climate Resilience Program? 
So CERTIP is a research and development program within the Office of Secretary of Defense, and ESTCP is a demonstration and validation program. So as a program manager, I simply help set the strategic direction for those programs under my purview, and we manage a technical committee that selects, solicits and selects proposals to do the science that we need to meet our climate resilience goals as a department. Before we dig into more details about your program there, this is being recorded after the conference, and we're going to talk a bit more about specifics from the conference later on, but just some 30,000-foot view, like first impressions. What were your thoughts about the conference? It was amazing. We had the largest attendance we've ever had for a a sort of innovation symposium. We had just the breadth of talent and topics that were discussed across all of our research programs from environmental restoration to biodiversity conservation and climate resilience was pretty amazing. And the quality of work being done by the performers really exceeds all expectations. So it was, I I think, without a doubt, just one of the best symposium that we've ever put on. Okay, let's dig into your program a bit more. Now, the resilience side of things, I mean, you you guys are there directing funding toward uh, research and such, but the resilience program is relatively new. How long has it been there with uh, your program? I mean, that well, the office there. We've invested in climate resilience research as well as demonstration evaluation for a long time, but having a separate standalone climate resilience portfolio is just about a year or two old, depending on when you start the clock. So this is our second fiscal year that we've been soliciting and funding projects under a standalone climate resilience program. And as such, we are relatively new, but that novelty really doesn't reflect the the depth and and time that we've been thinking about climate resilience, thinking about climate change and adaptation and requirements that the department needs. Those projects actually have been at least part of our portfolio all dating all the way back to about 2008. So a lot of groups out there that you fund, a lot of them haven't been doing adaptation planning, resilience planning for a while, and they're going to have to just thinking about resilience. And when you come up with, I guess, ways of getting these research dollars out there, how does that all work? Because there's probably some learning going on from the people that actually want to apply for research grants, right? Absolutely. And the Department of Defense is a pretty unique organization. It's massive. We've got the four services that each have unique combinations of needs. They occupy different landscapes. And then to have research partners and outside agencies and academic performers come in and try to compete for the application of their ideas for the Department of Defense needs often does take a translational piece. Performers have to understand the military mission. They have to understand that the department, though people have an impression it's top-down, it's very decentralized. Each installation or facility has kind of a unique combination of threats, be it environmental or encroachment. They've got a unique combination of mission requirements, Air Force, Space Force, Navy. And so being able to really give those academic performers or research agencies a sense of how their technology or their tools or their models might be useful for the military mission is an essential part of the outreach we do. And what about your team? So the program itself is relatively new, even though you've been doing the work for a while. Do you have a big team there? How do you guys do everything you do? So the program office, while it's pretty small, we only have five program managers and executive director, the support staff through our operations and maintenance uh, contract with Noblis is pretty large. We have uh, within the climate resilience portfolio, we, we have probably seven or eight individuals that support my program doing everything from strategic communications and document review to organizing proposal reviews in our technical committee and peer reviews of the project. So we do have uh, quite a bit of support, but the real work's done by the project PIs themselves, the principal investigators that are applying for the funding and to bring in their innovative ideas to uh, try and bring them to market. So you have this resilience track, and it's the first time that you, this annual conference has done that. And so I was there, and it was just huge. You had so many people there, and there were so many different things going on besides resilience. My head was kind of spinning, figuring that out. And obviously, my focus for this episode is on the resilience work that you're doing. But this resilience track for the conference, can you tell us how that unfolded? If this was your first time, what did you really hope to accomplish with it? So we sponsored several tracks to try to give folks an idea of what the Climate Resilience Program is currently and where we are trying to go with our investments in research development technology to support adaptation and mitigation. The first track was an overview of the program, and we brought in 
a variety of projects that we've funded, everything from linear features in the Arctic, such as roads and fire breaks and constructing them on permafrost, to coastal resilience and wave modeling off the coast of Virginia. And so to really give that program overview so that attendees kind of get a sense that that climate resilience is broad, that certainly doesn't prevent us from doing deeper dives, though. And we had a, a, a separate session that we sponsored on coastal resilience. With the expertise that we have represented on our uh, Department of Defense Climate Action Team, uh, which is also uh, within our organization, supporting those policy needs and the data needs is essential. And so doing uh, a coastal resilience focused special session allowed us to also show attendees that we're capable of supporting the depth needed on the strategic areas that are affecting the department, as well as covering the breadth of the kinds of crises that we'll face as climate change continues to affect military installations across the globe. The third special session that we sponsored, though, was one of my favorites, and that is an innovative approach. We introduced an innovative approach to technology transfer through co-production with end-user communities. Rather than seeing research and development and adaptation as this sort of linear uh, process of science support from idea generation to refinement to hand, hand off to an end-user community, we've actually embraced co-production, stepped into those end-user communities through a series of pilot projects called the National Innovation Landscape Network. And we're doing that with partners, agency partners like USGS, the Army Corps Engineers, U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And we're doing it with our science investment, as well as the managers and engineers out on installations and their partner landscapes. And so that focused and introducing that focused and co-production as a, a thematic area that's essential to adaptation is something that really was excited, well attended and well received. So you've been doing this for a while, then even though you have this new resilience program from the conference, did you have to have any takeaways that really is going to help inform doing something maybe a bit different in your program? Absolutely. Essentially, we know we have to go faster. Research and development, when done well, can be super strategic when we're thinking about science needs and support for the next decade's problems. But increasingly, we're being asked, both within the department and through partners, we're being asked to produce results much faster. And so we took away a variety of ideas, both in conversations and presentations, for how to improve the speed and responsiveness of our program. One of the themes that we're really highlighting within the climate resilience portfolio is going faster and being able to deliver priority needs to the end users with their engagement throughout that process. And I'm, I'm excited to see how fast we and how responsive we can be across the entire CERTIP and ESTCP portfolio. I came away with a, a variety of opportunities and ideas for at least how we're going to do that within climate resilience. John Conger is part of this episode, and he spoke at the conference. And his thing is, how do you do, speed up this, what you're just talking about there? And so he has a lot of interesting things to say because of his own previous experience in government. And I want to bring up, I went out to dinner with you and several of the, the guys there, and you guys were just on a roll in innovation and doing things more efficiently. And I had trouble keeping up because I wasn't doing the work that you're doing. But that dinner, you're you were talking about the things that you're talking about right now, though, right? What are some of the ways that you could really just make everything more efficient? Could you maybe just give some insight on that? We have to not just think about whether or not we're funding a new technology that's ready for an end user to refine and utilize. We need to think about how everything from top to bottom, how we can change processes. So what John and I were discussing at length is contracts are often uh, the most time consuming part of research or technology acquisition. And so taking advantage of every single tool we have available to get through the acquisition phase, contracting, cooperative agreements, uh, interagency agreements, thinking about what is really the logistics of acquisition as a research and development program and stepping back and asking, what about our processes need to change? And, and that doesn't mean they need to change wholesale, but do we need to add another tool to the toolbox? We need to be thinking about the way we coordinate with other funding agencies as well and thinking in creative ways that are really outside the box. And my hope is that in working with folks like John Conger that have a, a tremendous amount of experience in budget and planning, that we are able to communicate our, our own programmatic innovation 
in trying to improve our responsiveness to the end user needs requirements and the landscape's cha- changes that we're already experiencing across the department. Kevin, going back to the conference, it's been a a little bit of time, but the poster sessions were amazing. Again, I got kind of whiplash looking at the diversity of the research that you guys fund out there. Was there a couple, because you can't go into too much detail that that stood out for you that you were really impressed? I really don't know that I could pull off just one out of the hat. I think there there were more than 1,400 posters represented across what, four nights of uh, of presentations. And they, they really do just cover a tremendous breadth. One of the things that that I was really excited about was one poster in particular was presented by Dr. Gina Henderson at the Naval Academy. And she's been working on issues of glacial melt and late summer storms that impact the west coast of Greenland. And that project is a, a tremendous example of how we're not only leveraging great scientists like Gina, but also our future leaders in the services through our work and focus with the service academies on those projects being performed by future officers. For those out people out there maybe just in the, doing research, but they weren't familiar with it, you guys were up to, what do you recommend that they do to interact with you? I guess there's a formal process and such, but probably hopefully there's informal ways that they can kind of communicate with your program. Absolutely. One of the ways that we, we're hoping that we can be responsive to both ideas and end-user requirements is through the Innovation Landscape Network. As we've established the initial five pilots, and, and we're hoping to expand that to seven by the end of next year, we're hopeful to have coordinators that, that really are embedded within those key geographies that have high concentrations of Department of Defense assets. And so from the departmental perspective, we're, we're hoping to continuously perform a needs assessment with our end user communities and our research partners through those more dynamic co-production relationships. Outside of that, we definitely host workshops to evaluate science needs requirements across all of our program areas. We do that frequently. When we met up there at the St. Louis Climate Resilience Workshop, we actually were co-hosting at that workshop our own science needs assessment for ecosystem process models. And so we we try to bring in the, the science and end user community whenever we can to really unpack whether it's a class of tools like that or a topic uh, like invasive species in the, the Pacific Islands. Uh, we try to work with our partners to understand the need and prioritize the uh, the research opportunities. Can you give us a favorite moment from the conference overall? The workshop for me, really comes down to having people exchange ideas. For me, the National Innovation Landscape Network Special Session, listening to Deb Loomis, have, who has a policy vision for how adaptation is going to occur within the Navy, have her relate her fearlessness and risk tolerance. The idea that we have to go, we got to get off the beach, the old Saving Planet Ryan scene. The department and its leadership is capable of taking good risks with respect to our focus on adaptation and science support for it. We're not afraid to fail. And as she said in in her speech, to fail fast, fail forward. We're going to learn fast, but we're going to learn through action. And that really was inspiring to me. All right, Kevin, it was a treat to have you on and just fantastic that we were able to reconnect after so much time. And it sounds like you're doing amazing work with the Department of Defense. Well, thanks so much, Doug, for having me. It's it's been fantastic to listen to your podcast and now to be a part of one. Hey, Adapters, joining me is Deborah Loomis. Deb is the Senior Advisor for Climate Change to the Secretary of the Navy. Hi, Deb. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug. It's so great to be here. I'm talking with someone with the Navy. Can you briefly tell us what you do there as the senior advisor? Yeah, (laughs) briefly is a good word. So I am the senior advisor for climate change to the secretary of the Navy. And one thing to clarify right out of the gate is that means that we oversee both the United States Navy and the United States Marine Corps in the Department of the Navy. And as the climate advisor, I advise and and champion our efforts across an entire spectrum. You can imagine those two organizations are vast, and it's everything from we have doctors and public health systems to institutions of higher education and how you're integrating climate change into curricula. We have, of course, bases all around the country and around the world. And so looking at, from an adaptation perspective, how 
you know, installation, master planning and facilities and, and all sorts of things. And then, of course, as we have ships, we have aircraft, we have tactical vehicles, and there's so much in between. It is broad and it is a lot of fun and very challenging and a, a real privilege. You alluded to it, but let's dig a little bit deeper there. So how is the Department of Navy working in climate adaptation? Well, we are, as a coastal organization, of course, that's what immediately comes to mind is you're the Navy and Marine Corps, you are on the coast. And we certainly are. We have installations or bases from Maine to Hawaii to Japan and Korea and Guam. So climate change is on our doorstep in a very real way in those places. And we are implementing all sorts of solutions from the built environment and kind of traditional infrastructure like seawalls, et cetera, to nature-based solutions, living shorelines, dune restorations, mangroves, you name it, and hybrid solutions. What people think about less is that actually some of our largest bases are in the arid west. So we have Marine Corps Air Station Yuma, which is in Yuma, Arizona, and it is very dry there and it's a million acres. Similarly, on the Navy side, we have Naval Air Weapons Station's China Lake. That's the United States Navy's largest base. And it's in a very dry part of California. And that is also a million acres. So the challenges in adaptation are very different in kind of a coastal context versus a desert context. Then you've got a whole range of other issues related, of course, to energy, resilience, and things like that. So we are really tackling adaptation across a spectrum of different challenges. So Kevin Hears, he's from CERTUP, and he's part of this episode. He said that he saw your talk in the Innovation Landscape Technical Session, and he said one of the highlights for him was that you challenged everyone to not fear failure, but, but to fail forward through action and learning. What did you mean by that? Yeah, that's great. And and Kevin has been a wonderful partner to us. So when I, as the climate advisor, look at climate change and sort of what is the most wicked problem that I see for civilization, for society you know, going forward, I think about kind of water scarcity and that downward spiral of when land starts to fail and it's not supporting crops or it's not providing as much water, you get sort of this like death spiral of aridification, desertification, then water and food insecurity. And we are facing that. We see that on our Western bases and thinking more geostrategically as the United States Navy, as an organization whose mission is national security. I think about those problem sets in other parts of the world, from the Middle East to Central America to Africa, of course. And so I really wanted to use our installations in the West as a test bed, as a let's figure out how you can take installations that are getting drier and drier and climate change is putting its finger on the scales of that. What can we do to rehydrate those landscapes, make them more resilient? And, and that has tremendous benefits for us so that we are more resilient. And as a security organization, it can be a demonstration for the world. When you do that, when you're operating in sort of this like, I won't call it a blank space because there are people and examples around the world who are doing great things, but it is a less well understood space. So when you're doing that, you're going to fail. The objective is to try different things and to see what works. And that is a very uncomfortable place sometimes in any organization, certainly in the Department of the Navy, where people don't want to take great risks and don't. I, I've had people say to me, Deb, this could fail. And I said, yes, great. Let's go. Because the, the last point I'll make is in, in the context of climate change, we know this is the critical decade. We need to move the needle significantly by 2030 on climate. We cannot just nibble around the edges. We have to make a difference now. So you answered, I think, part of this question, but I want to bring it up in the context of something you and I chatted about before. And so what does it mean to view climate change through the lens of water? Sure. Well, of course, when we think of climate change, we think of greenhouse gases, and they are, of course, what is driving climate change. But when you think about how climate impacts actually manifest, what is it that we are kind of on the receiving end of? You think of things like wildfires, sea level rise, drought, 
flooding and, and extreme precipitation and storms and glaciers melting and temperatures rising, well, what is the common element in all of those impacts? They stem from the water cycle. And so it's really about, and, and in fact, water vapor is the most abundant greenhouse gas. A lot of people don't know that. And water vapor drives the temperature dynamics on this planet. That is not to discount the role of CO2 and the other greenhouse gases, which, of course, are, are what's aggravating the water cycle. Like looking at what we have to contend with climate change, it's too much water, too little water or water that's in the wrong place in the wrong time. And so that's what I mean. If you stand there and look at climate change, now you sort of see different actions to take or additional, not different. I want to be clear because we have to go, we have to electrify, we have to get off fossil fuels as quickly as possible, go pedal to the metal on that. And there's a whole nother suite of actions that we need to take if we really view it through the lens of water. Again, you've used a lot of examples here, but I'm just, I guess, getting specifically to, can you help my listeners connect nature-based resilience and climate adaptation to the Department of Navy's mission? And I mean, you've touched upon these things, but nature-based approach really is important for you guys. For sure. We are looking at, as I said, our, our Western bases and in places that are very dry. And we were trying to organize a workshop recently, and I wanted to set up a, a kind of site visit to this space. And the base was like not really sure about water resilience and why it mattered. And they're like, we're kind of busy and we can't really hope. And oh, by the way, we can't host you right now because that Hurricane Hillary that came through the West Coast, people thought it wasn't such a big deal, but it took out most of our roadways on our range. They're impassable. So we couldn't bring you out if we wanted to. And I said, well, that's kind of why I'm coming out actually, because I really want to look at how can we leverage nature? How can we make those soils deal with and infiltrate more water so that when it comes in these increasingly flashy flood events, an increasing kind of speed and ferocity, your lands are better equipped to deal with it and it's not washing out your roads. <laughs> so that's an example of kind of translating it for people of, of now they see the connection of how you can leverage nature to ameliorate a real problem that they're dealing with. How does adaptation fit in with education at the Navy? And I'm just thinking top to bottom, how are you guys bringing that in? I think it's a great question. I mean, climate literacy in general, we could talk about. Sometimes people don't see how climate connects to them. And I'll make a, a quick Maybe non-adaptation, maybe it does fall in the bucket of adaptation, but I was down at Marine Corps Recruit Depot, Paris Island, which is in South Carolina, very recently, and I was speaking with a commanding general, and I said, what is most important to you? What do you care about with climate change? And he said, as a recruit center where we train Marines, we build Marines, as they say down there, I worry about heat. There's a technology that they're experimenting with where the Marines will have kind of a device on their chest that kind of like a, a heart rate monitor, and then the drill sergeant or whatever a leader of that unit will have on their phone an app that says private so-and-so is at 107 degrees, we should go check on him or her. So that's what he was really concerned about, heat. And he wanted to make sure I was keeping tabs on this. So then I went back, I came back to the Pentagon and I asked uh, at Marine Corps headquarters, I said, hey, I'm interested in hearing about this technology. And they say, why do you care? You're the climate advisor. And then it was a very short conversation to say, well, heat is going up and I care about the safety of Marines and, and heat is relevant to climate. And so they connected the dots. But the first instance was not connecting heat and the safety of Marines in boot camp to climate change consideration. So it's an ongoing process of having people sort of see themselves in the climate challenge. And then, of course, in sort of strict adaptation terms, you've got people like master planners and facility engineers and natural resource managers are on the front lines if we're talking specifically about nature-based solutions. I think the challenge there or the gap we're trying to fill, and it's not a total gap, but I think we need to reinforce this 
understanding of solution sets. And it's sort of a cross. We have a lot of biologists that are brought here to work on things like endangered species or complying with environmental laws like the Clean Water Act and things like that. And then you've got engineers who are there to build buildings. And there's this nexus between the two of adaptation solutions. And I think that is a a real growth area that we're trying to get better at and get cross-pollinate and get people smarter on. Yeah, I think only recently people really associating extreme heat is the number one killer associated with climate change at the moment. People aren't really dying of sea level rise at the moment. And so, yeah, it's getting a lot more tension. So that's great. Yeah. Okay. Can you tell us a a little bit about your partnership with CERTUP? How are you partnering with them? How are they a resource with you? CERTUP and Kevin Harris, who you mentioned, they have come alongside because, as I said at the outset, I had really picked out the West as a proving ground that I said, I want to do the hard things. We can figure out how to rehydrate these landscapes and make sort of ecosystems thrive again. We will have moved the needle and we will have done a service, not just for ourselves, but I think for humanity. And we wanted to do that at scale because our largest bases are out there. And so what Kevin hires and the CERTIP team was looking for innovation on landscapes at scale. And so I think those two, and and he wants to do the R&D and really trial different approaches because we both recognize, as I said, sort of at the outset, the time for nibbling at the edges and doing like little pilot projects, which you then hope one day someone will pick up and scale. We, We don't have that luxury of time. And so that's the challenge. How do you go big and fast all at once while doing it smart? And you're gonna make mistakes and you just have to have a tolerance for that and people have to be okay with that. But it's not easy. But Kevin has come alongside to provide. So we are serving as his, the the Department of the Navy is serving as the head for that Southwestern Landscape Innovation Network. So that's how we're working together. Fantastic. Okay, last question. What's up next for you? What's going to be keeping you busy in this climate change space? (laughs) As I look to the next year, I'm really focused on institutionalizing an adaptation. I don't know if it's a core, but a capability and all the way around from what does that really mean to do adaptation well? and to have it be just in the fabric of how this organization does business. I mentioned right now, there's a kind of a seam between our environmental staffs, which are there to do compliance and our engineering staffs, which are really more focused traditionally on kind of cement and steel and and building structures. And that is reflected in our trainings in, we don't have enough data, like to GIS, geospatial data. Our geospatial data right now is really focused on things like structures and utility lines and not on that natural environment to know, hey, when we are expecting this sea level rise projection, what does that mean for this base? And different bases have done different assessments and different studies, but as an enterprise, as a department, really understanding what our risks are, what our vulnerabilities are to kind of real loss of property, to loss of mission, et cetera. And then providing people the education and the training on adaptation and adaptation solutions. I'm really focused on solutions. I I'm not a scientist. And so for better or for worse, that that comes with good and bad. But I have like kind of little patience at this stage for another tool that's going to show me my risks. I got it. I can appreciate that we have risks and we can always refine the risk. What I'm really more interested in right now is what are we going to do about it? Let's work on solution sets. And so I think Getting people familiar with the range of options that are out there and and what do you care about? What are the important metrics in an adaptation context? And to me, it's that's right back to water. It's how is your land or how is this infrastructure going to deal with water and with heat, et cetera? So that's what I'm trying to do is really institutionalize that adaptation capability and capacity. Excellent. Well, Deb, thanks for coming on the podcast and thanks for the work that you're doing there in the Navy. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Hey, Adapters. Joining me is Michelle Michaels. Michelle is the Arctic Innovation Portfolio Manager for the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy, Installations, and Environment. Hi, Michelle. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug. Thanks for having me. That's a really cool title, Arctic Innovation Portfolio Manager. Give me a little bit of the history of that. 
Yeah. So basically, I was brought on to work uh, in this office in the DoD so that I can really help with bridging the gap between innovation as it's coming out of the research and development program and getting that into the hands of the end users at the installation level who could use the innovation and technology that's coming out of our research development program. And so specifically, I'm working with the Arctic landscape, so mostly focused regionally in Alaska, but also trying to scale technology for the greater Arctic region in the north. That's what I want to talk about here. And I saw one of your presentations, and I want you to tell me just really at the 30,000 foot level, and then we can kind of get into some details. What is the Alaska Innovation Landscape Network? The Alaska Innovation Landscape Network is there are two goals that we have. One is to institute an interagency network of partners at the regional level to bring together the idea of we want to institute climate adaptation practices at the community and installation level that are really useful for the climate challenges the Arctic is facing now and in the future as well. So we want to bring people together, researchers and end users, as we call them, which would be the installation managers and the community members, to really talk about what the climate challenges are that the end users are facing and how the research and technology that's being developed and things that are being proposed can really get at what the challenges are at that installation and community level. So there's currently a little bit of a disconnect between the research and technology that's being produced out of our large research programs and getting that into the hands of people that really use that technology. And so the Alaska Innovation Landscape Network, or Eileen for short, is what we are establishing to bring together a network of people to facilitate that process better. So it's basically starting a deeper conversation and a more fluid conversation between those different groups of people so that we can get this technology moving faster at a quicker pace to really address our climate adaptation challenges. Okay, I know you can't go into too much detail here, but for the need to do this in the first place, what's happening up there in Alaska? And I'm talking about the built infrastructure and the natural infrastructure. What's going on there that there's this need? So one of the big issues with built infrastructure is that we're seeing a lot of problems with permafrost degradation, specifically in Alaska and other areas of the Arctic, and that affecting the construction considerations needed to build in those locations. So you see a lot of issues, and you can certainly find pictures online everywhere, where the permafrost is subsiding, and you have buildings that are then sat on top of it that are kind of cracking and crumbling a bit and just not stable at all. And that's due to the layer of permafrost below it that's being degraded by warming temperatures. That's one of the issues we're seeing with built infrastructure. With natural infrastructure, we're having some issues with hydrology and groundwater flow effects. So you'll see a lot of areas where there's maybe a low, a shallow groundwater table. And so there's a lot of flooding occurring. And we're seeing that at some of our installations as well. But you recently had a workshop, well, maybe not too recent. Who was invited and what was the purpose of that workshop? And I think you were trying to accomplish three things there at that workshop. Yep. So the workshop was in late August when we held that in Fairbanks, Alaska. And we were really trying to accomplish a couple things. The main thing was just the kicking off of the Alaska Innovation Landscape Network. And that same concept that I introduced the network with was bringing the researchers and end users in the same room. The main point of the workshop was we had those two different groups of people, so researchers from federal agencies and universities. And we brought them together with our installation managers, uh, natural resource managers, planners, those kinds of folks. And we really wanted to kickstart the conversation to say, what are your needs as end users from the research and technology that we're developing within our programs? And how can we address those? Because These ecosystem transformations are happening at a rapid pace, and we really need to accelerate our climate adaptation practices to address them. And we want to make sure that what we're producing and what we're working on and the proposals that we're writing as researchers are addressing those needs at your level at the installation and the community level. 
the big, big overarching goal of the workshop was to bring those two communities together. We spent the first half of the day with research presentations from across our different agencies and partners with giving a sort of status of technology and research as it is. And then the second half of the afternoon was a feedback session for mostly aimed at the end users to have their feedback on what they'd seen during the day and what their needs are and what they need us to facilitate going forward. We kind of split it up that way, but it was a really, really fruitful session and we had a lot of great feedback. And we started in the morning with a list. We had asked the end users in the room to talk about what were your top climate adaptation priorities. And we just did that for 15 minutes. And then we came back to that list at the end of the day after we'd had all of our research presentations, all of our discussion, and we said, what has changed for you? And we did actually have a lot of new considerations that we added to the list. And we said, okay, this is our overarching list going forward for what we want to tackle and address as a group and as a network. So that was a really great kickstart to this network and just trying to get folks together to have these kinds of conversations. Okay. So I'm sure the practitioners were like, okay, fantastic. The researchers are listening to us and they're taking our ideas. Are you guys in a position where there's actually funding to do that research? Yes. Yeah, so specifically, Certip and ESTCP are investing funding into this network and into this regional landscape, as we're calling it. We're doing so through a couple of different ways. One of those ways is through specific targeted investments and invited proposals where we see a research need or a need to take a research technology and kind of cross it over the finish line, over the valley of deaths, so to speak, and to get that into production. So where there's areas where there's a really promising research technology and we just need to add you know, investment to get that over the finish line, we're, we're really focused on those. We're really focused on funding research and technology through our open solicitations that come out in cycle, usually once a year, or also we're having some new out of cycle solicitations to combat the same, these same issues here. So through those open solicitations, we're really trying to have some of them address this need here. And that is our traditional process of funding through the research and development program. We're also trying to gain interest from our partners as well so that we can leverage some competitive solicitation opportunities with them as well. So we are partnered with USGS as well, the United States Geological Survey, and some other interagency partners to try and build upon those open solicitations and get more investment into the program. So I think there's a phase two to this project? Yes. So the next phase of our network development here is to gather a group of folks together that would compose our leadership team So that would be the folks that are really making the strategic decisions at our higher level here for the network. And we want to develop a strategy and implementation plan so we know where we're going and we have a direction for how exactly we want to accomplish this. And then there's the part where this research and technology that we're investing in, that we're trying to get transferred and deployed at the installation community level, we can all see that as the possibility to deploy transfer nodes as well. So that concept is where if you have a technology, let's say it's really suitable for climate adaptation in Alaska, well, it's possible that may also be very well scalable to other regions of the Arctic as well. So perhaps Greenland or somewhere like that, where we could take this technology that we've demonstrated and evaluated in Alaska and we can also do that same demonstration, evaluation, refinement practice in Greenland as well, so that we can really make our technology more scalable. So that would be the idea of having a transfer node to have at a different location in the Arctic. And then another aspect of this, another phase in the process here, is to establish science translation. So the idea would be, let's say that there's some building standards or practices that are affected by some of this work specifically for building and constructing in the Arctic. Once that's instituted into something that's more or less policy, we want to make sure that the communities of practice that work on that and that are in that field are really, they're understanding how that is affecting them. So if there's new standards 
or new things to operate by, we want to make sure that they know how that affects them and have some sort of investment in adopting those practices so that we're engineering with the best new design standards that are suitable for constructing, building an Arctic environment. So that would be an example of trying to translate our science into application. Fantastic. A lot of great information there. Tell me a highlight from the conference. I think one of my biggest takeaways, highlights from the conference was not only the breadth of different folks from different, from different disciplines and industries and and agencies that were there and all of the broad range of topics that were covered, but also just how energetic and engaging the symposium was. Everyone seemed to be extremely engaged in the topics that they were talking about and the research that they were doing. And it really was a very energetic environment. I certainly learned a lot about different fields that I hadn't had that much background in and had some great engagement with folks that I think is going to be really useful moving forward in the sense that we can be more collaborative on our efforts, which is also one of the main pillars of having these different regional landscape networks is trying to help foster research and technology that helps with climate adaptation practices. So getting people together in the same room and having these conversations is an absolutely great step to doing that. Yeah, it was fantastic vibe, huge numbers of people. And certainly highlight for me were those crab cakes because they had these giant chunks of crab. I probably need to interview the chef who did that because you never get that sort of crab in a crab cake. So bravo to, <laughs> <laughs> to have a dad. I think I missed the crab cakes. Oh I'll have to get those next time. <laughs> those huge chunks of blue crab. They never do that. It's usually all bread. So anyway, you know, kudos to the caterer on that is respect. Okay. Michelle, it's been a pleasure having you on. You're doing some cool work there. And thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, Adapters. Joining me is Lisa Miller. Lisa is a Senior Manager for Sustainability at Noblis. Hi, Lisa. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug. Thanks for having me. We're going to start off big picture here. What is Noblis? So Noblis is a nonprofit science and technology organization. We contract to the federal government and we focus on providing innovative solutions. And specifically, I work in the defense mission area in the resilience and sustainability team where we, our experts develop strategies and advanced analytical tools that kind of focus on remediation challenges, energy security threats, climate risk, that sort of thing. When I first encountered you guys, I thought you guys were just like conference organizers. But as you just described, there's a lot more to it. And so your team is embedded with some of these agencies, right? Correct. Yeah. So CERTIP and ESTCP is one of the customers that we support. So other than the conference planning, we also provide technical expertise, helping them with their program direction, helping them manage their broad portfolio of research projects and working to plan and execute the the OD Energy and Environment Innovation Symposium that you attended with us. Tell me a little bit about your role in the conference, your role and also Noblis's role, because there were three tracks. And obviously, I was focused on the resilience track. How did that all come together? Because the resilience track is a relatively new one, right? You guys didn't do that last year. Yeah. So the climate resilience program that was recently developed under CERTIP and ESTCP, Noblis actually did a feasibility study with CERTIP to kind of see if there was a need for a program like that. And we helped them stand the program up once we did realize that there was a a good space for that. So we created a track for that at this year's symposium, and we're hoping that next year it's going to grow even more. Tell me a little bit about that. So you've been involved with their conferences in the past. What, what are some of your observations, how they've changed? Yeah, so I've been the lead planner for the event for the past six, seven years, and it's been really great to see how some of the programming has shifted into new priorities. PFAS, for example, has become a hot topic, as I'm sure you're well aware. but It's been this year in particular, there was a record attendance and we had over 700 posters throughout the event. We switched them out each night. So we were able to focus on over 700 different projects and technologies, which I thought was really exciting to be able to see that broad range of science and the technology advancements. Yeah, I had never encountered that before because there was a ton of posters and I was walking around each night. And the second night, I want to go back to one because there was a really interesting poster. And you guys were like changing them out. That's how many people were part of this event. That was actually pretty cool. Yeah, we, we do that every year. This was the first time we'd done three 
poster days, different days of posters, but we wanted to get all them in so that we could see all their technologies. One of the people that I met that works for Noblis was Tracy Mallard, Dr. Tracy Mallard. And she is, re- could you tell me some of the work that she's doing with this group? Yeah, Dr. Tracy Mallard has been working closely with Dr. Kevin Hires on the CERTIP team on the new initiative that they're calling the National Innovation Landscape Network, where they're pulling together different installations that experience similar conditions to help implement new technologies on their at their sites. Great. So final question for you, any conference highlights that stood out? I was really excited about the plenary session. We had some really great speakers there and to listening to Mr. McGee and his comments about where he thought the programs were headed and some highlighting a few of the technologies that he was interested in. Um, I thought that was a really great piece of the, of the symposium. Great. And if people want to learn more about Noblis, what do you suggest? Noblis.org is the best place to get more information. Great. Lisa, thanks for coming on and thanks for all your help at the conference. Your whole team there was fantastic. I'm glad you had a good time, and I hope to see you next year at the next one. Hey, Adapters. Joining me is John Conger. John is the president of Conger Strategies and Solutions. Hi, John. Welcome back to the podcast. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. John, let's give people a little bit of background. You've been on before, but it's been a little while. So what is Conger Strategies and Solutions? Conger Strategies is just my consulting hat. I am also the Director Emeritus for the Center of Climate and Security, And frankly, I do a lot of thinking in this space as the former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy Installations and Environment. So this used to be my world. On that note, can you give us a bit more of that history within the Department of Defense? I mean, it's extensive and you also have Capitol Hill experience too, right? Absolutely. I I spent a dozen years on Capitol Hill. So I understand the sausage making of how legislation is is made and how the federal government is funded. But the building, the Pentagon, was really a learning experience. And I got some quality time, both as the deputy running the installations and environment office and then running it for three years in OSD. So I I had about a trillion dollars worth of real estate I was responsible for. And at the same time, I was DOD's climate guy, uh, the person that DOD would send over to the White House for, you know, to represent DOD for all federal meetings and stuff. I'm sure a lot has changed since you were actually within working within government, now doing what you're doing, right? Well, some things have changed and some things haven't. The government is slow. It's like, as they say, steering the aircraft carrier. So as you turn the ship, it it is not exactly turning on a dime. And so some things are very similar to the way they were even 10 years ago. So we were both at this conference and we're recording this after the fact. But you gave a presentation that I thought was fantastic. Do you remember the title of your presentation? I don't think I had a title. My goal was to get the people's juices flowing and to give them a few challenges to think about as they work through how they're going to integrate innovation into their R&D processes and specifically focusing on the National Innovation Landscape Network. We're going to dig into that a bit, but just starting off, and I don't, I don't know if this was your quote or just a quote that you like, but you had strategy without money is hallucination. Did I get that right? What did you mean? Yeah, by that? that means that you can make all the plans you want, but if you don't fund any of the activities that you are talking about, then it's just words. I can't pretend to have made that up. I've heard it many, many times, repeated it in many, many ways. And it's just one of those old sayings that you hear bouncing around the, frankly, not just the federal government, but certainly oftentimes there. The points that you were trying to make, and obviously relevant to CERTUP, they're funding research out there. And you talked about timescales are different for what CERTUP is doing. They're out there funding all these innovative ideas, but then those are different timescales than policymakers and the public at large. What did you mean? So I used to run the installations and environment office at DOD. And Uh, The challenge you have is that when you have problems presented, you need answers moderately quickly. And if the CERTA process, the research process that they have, takes two years to from idea and notice to submissions coming in, going through multiple rounds of review, finally getting an award, finally getting their money, and then taking three to five years to execute, that gets me an answer in six years, but I'm gone by that somehow they need a layer added to the research and development enterprise at the Department of Defense where you can get an answer in six months, not six years. 
something has to be done quicker. And that really brings you to the need for a different way of doing business. Can you elaborate? And that example of what they're trying to do at sort of now, how's that going to change that approach? So they're going to go through uh, some processes to try and and figure out exactly what they're going to change. But as we think about innovation, as we think about catalyzing processes and getting ourselves out of the old mindset that I have to follow all the steps, sometimes you can circumvent the proposal process and do much quicker awards. Sometimes you can have people who've already done the work figure out how it applies to a specific problem. So if I have a question and there's people out there who have the knowledge, I want to be able to leverage them immediately and get my answer in a time scale where it's relevant, doesn't come overcome by events, right? And so in that context, what they're looking to do is set up a network where the scientists and the users, the operators and the policymakers are all talking together and they all know each other because they don't talk to each other today. Then the users and the operators, the people at the bases can say, here's the actual problem I'm running into, not have scientists guess at it. Those scientists can say, well, here's the knowledge we already have. Here are models we already have, and we can apply them to your problems and get them answers much more quickly rather than going through that process, that longer multiple year process. You want to be able to have people talking to each other I have my own experience in the federal government, and I'm thinking of how you bridge this gap. And sometimes even if people with the best intentions want to do things more quickly, sometimes things are intractable. Maybe there's legislative reportings that's necessary that just feeds into this idea of lengthy. I mean, who's responsible? Is it just are these policy decisions, let's say, at the cert up level or is – Congress going to have to get involved to free up the ability to make these, I guess, be more nimble? Because you, you know what I'm talking about, that there's yes. different layers to people kind of making things take longer. But let's say legislatively, if you're just working within CERTA, you're just, all right, well, I've, I'm required by law to do this. So the rules are set up to reduce risk. There's rules are set up usually to say, well, we here was a problem we had in the past. We're going to set up a new rule and it lengthens the process. And I'm not saying that the process they go through today is wrong. I'm saying it needs a new layer. You can, in today's process, have short term proposals and short term responses and get money out, maybe have some flexible funds that aren't necessarily designated for these longer term projects. And so what I mean by that is, let's say I'm a policymaker and I have a question. And let's say I, or or even better, let's say I'm an operator at a base in Alaska and I have a permafrost problem and I need somebody who has the tools and the models to assess how I'm going to deal with permafrost under my base. Rather than go through a long process, maybe I have a shorter term, maybe I already have a list of approved individuals who can answer my questions that are on a some sort of a, a multiple award task order contract with no money against it yet until I ask my question. And then they can go out and do a quick analysis because they're pre-approved and I've already worked with them. And then they can get me my answer for a really modest amount of money rather than a, than a multiple year project, that kind of thing. That's an example of what can be done today and doesn't necessarily circumvent any of the rules. I'll give you one other example, and it's outside the climate space, but it's something that Certip is doing. They have some folks that are working on how to destroy PFAS, the forever chemicals, and they teamed with the Defense Innovation Unit, which is a different organization within the Department of Defense, which has some enhanced authorities to go more quickly through the acquisition process. And so they brought, sort of brought their money to DIU to use their authorities to do a very quick test of a wide range of technologies and entities who had technologies ready to perform this mission. And they're going to test them all at the same time as sort of like a, they call it a bake-off where they're all going to destroy PFAS and see who does it better. The point being that there are ways to do it within within current authorities, but people have to get their brains out of the same old, same old, out of this is the way it's always been done. 
things are kind of moving in that direction, though, because even at the conference and some of those discussions, and I witnessed this at a dinner with you and some of the gang there, that the, there's efforts to, to simplify this process or at least I mean, make it more relevant to what the re- research and the policymaker needs are, right? Yeah, they are looking for the ways to do this. I think that the startup leadership is very comfortable with setting up this additional layer, which is why you have the the National Innovation Landscape Network in the first place. It got created. I talked to the program manager within the organization maybe a year ago complaining about the timescale problem. And lo and behold, he acted so quickly and created this network within what he's currently authorized to do. And so that's responsiveness, that's energy, and that's innovation. John, you were at the Climate Resilience Conference that the Department of Defense put on in St. Louis earlier this year, and the whole thing was focused on resilience. Any insights? There was a tract of resilience at this one versus that. Any thoughts, kind of comparisons? So there were different conferences for different purposes. I would say that the CERTIP conference included a lot more. The CERTIP conference included many more researchers actually delving into the their work that they've done, they've had funded uh, to attack specific problems. Uh, there was more policymaking. There was broader uh, conversations at the Climate Resilience Conference. So that's one piece of it. I thought that there was a focus on landscape, natural systems types of things at the Climate Resilience Conference this summer. That's That's who they had there. This was a more diverse problem set, not just on climate at the CERTIP conference. All right. So any particular highlight for you at this conference? At this one? Well, my highlight was the conversations on innovation. No question about it. I am I'm very impressed with how many people were there. I'm very impressed with the, the breadth of the research, but I'm more excited about looking for new ways to the innovation theme The I remember back when I worked for Ash Carter and I, I was the deputy controller at the time, actually, after I was doing the installations work. And he said in that year's budget, and it was in 2016, so it was the FY 2017 budget, he said that the one program he wanted to make sure we got funded above all else was the beginnings of the Defense Innovation Unit. It was DIUX at the time. And the fact of the matter is, is that this kind of innovation, this kind of doing things differently is what he was trying to capture then. And I think it's really caught in hold and gotten a little bit of momentum. So I think that's very exciting. John, thanks for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Hey, Adapters. I'm here with... Abby Rice. All right, Abby, who are you with? I'm with the Construction Engineering Research Laboratory located in Champaign, Illinois. That's part of the Engineer Research Development Center, or ERDIC. Okay, ERDIC. What's that? We like to describe ourselves as like the research arm of the Corps of Engineers. Most people are familiar with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They think things like locks and dams, levees, those kind of mission sets. And what we really focus on is the research and development that can propel those efforts, but also supports the Army, its mission, and the broader DOD. What is your specific role with them? So I'm a research environmental engineer, largely focused on solid waste. So I am the technical program lead for the source reduction and resource resilience program. So I focus largely on solid waste, but waste is in everything, right? It's in what we touch. It's in our from our heat waste from energy systems. It can be waste water. It can be hazardous waste. And I try and reimagine that waste as a resource. So we think, oh, we can just throw that away, discard it later, forget about it until it becomes a problem. I think. Every piece of waste in any system that you're looking at, whether it's energy systems, water systems, infrastructure systems, we can reimagine that with a little bit of innovation as a resource that we can use to our benefit for resilience. You gave a presentation that I saw. What was the title of that presentation? Integrated Installation Resilience Policy. Give us that 30,000 foot view level and then we'll dig into your presentation a little bit. Sure. So 30,000 foot level is that we can do better at reducing redundancies and being more strategic in, say, the planning, programming and resourcing that we do around resilience. So, for example, you have energy resilience, you have water resilience, you have waste resilience, you have community resilience. 
We tend to get in those foxholes, kind of put our blinders on, right? Everything is very stovepiped. And the idea is that we can be more resilient if we integrate across those systems and leverage them to the benefit of everyone. I'm a firm believer that you can find research, development, planning, innovative solutions that will touch more than one of those buckets. But it requires collaboration, it requires integration, and it requires people to talk to each other. Okay, so part of that resilience, too, is resilience to climate impacts, right? Absolutely. Climate resilience is a piece of that. And I think we're seeing more and more now when we start focusing on mitigation and adaptation, really adaptation, integrating climate into, say, how we build our infrastructure. That is integration, right? It requires climate scientists and climate policymakers and decision makers within DOD to talk to the people who are building infrastructure, say, within the Corps of Engineers or some other organization, right? Climate can be integrated into water resilience. into inter- It can be integrated and should be integrated into any decision that we're making. So when we're thinking about adapting infrastructure for climate, that's the type of integration we're talking about and the collaborations that's needed in order to do that efficiently and effectively. Bases have a lot of responsibilities and they have to do a lot of planning. Part of the slides that you showed, you had all these other responsibilities. These are these planning efforts that bases have to consider. And you are looking at how that's integrating with the resilience plans. Did I get that right? So when you say resilience plans, I think what people are thinking about is the newly established installation climate resilience plans. And so what that's done, that came out of a statutory requirement. It was written into National Defense Authorization Act, and that came out of Title 10 United States Code 2860. It's a new requirement that you also consider climate as well as I believe transportation was thrown in there as well to those installation master plan required plans. So when you think about The climate resilience piece, that's a new plan. It's written into Unified Facility Criteria 2-100-01, and that requires installations to now develop installation climate resilience plans. It's another plan. It's another separate plan on top of the other 20, 30, however many other planning requirements there are. There's going to be redundancy in that, right? It takes more resourcing. It takes more staff. It takes time away from other things, especially at an installation level where a lot of those installation staff are already overburdened wearing five hats. It's hard not to just check the box and move on to the next thing when you have 50 priorities on your plate for any given day. And so to the extent that we can look at how we can integrate across those plans and leverage them to create them, I think that's important. Just from a personal standpoint, I think we could also reduce planning requirements if we integrate them. And I'll give an example to that. There's a requirement for installation master planning that it requires all installations or certain installations to have installation energy plans. And I can really only speak to Army and and probably the other military departments do this as well. I'm just most familiar with Army through the Corps of Engineers. And they don't do IEPs or installation energy plans. They do IEWPs, installation energy and water plans. That's just one very small example. And I think we could get even broader than that to include climate in those plans. So it becomes an installation water and energy plan with climate included. Maybe it includes some other aspects as well. And the more you can integrate and get people talking to each other, I think you'll see projects that come out of those plans, best practices or recommendations that can touch all of these places. I can't believe you're remembering these planning numbers off the top of your head. I don't think I remembered a single government executive order number when I worked for the federal government. So that's pretty amazing. I guess that's how much is important for you. So you talked about the climate resilience planning part of this and how it's aligning with all the other planning requirements. Are there gaps that you guys are seeing now that as you are bringing on this new climbing effort? I would say the installation climate resilience plans, while they've developed some, they're continuing to evolve, right? There's no set standard yet, at at least, again, I can only speak to the Army perspective. I, I don't think there's a complete standard or framework. I think some of that will evolve over time. It was a congressional requirement to develop a certain number per year per, I, I believe, major military installations, and I could be misquoting the directive there. But I think it will continue to change as we learn more, and I'm sure that there are gaps. Hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? Okay, let's talk about this conference. There's a lot of resilience experts here and the whole notion of adaptation and resilience. Have you been learning anything, anything that's going to help you go back and do what you're doing? I have. I actually sat on a really interesting talk today. It was in the sea level rise session, and they were talking about how we do a lot of 
planning and we look historically backwards, right? That's not going to get us anywhere when we're talking about developing things, adaptation measures, infrastructure that's supposed to last 20, 30, 50, 80 years from now. And I think to the degree that we can use data to our advantage and we can only make the best decisions with the information that we have, but to the extent that we can learn from the past, but not use it as the standard because things are going to continue to change. What some of that gets at is we have to be planning for the future and that time scale really matters, right? If we're building something that's supposed to last beyond 50 years, maybe we don't have to adapt right now because things will change, but we should be building in adaptation into whatever we're creating today so that when things do change in 10 years that were unexpected to us, we have the agility to be able to adapt in the future. I think that's really important. Another thing that we talk about a lot and what this kind of sparked and reinforced in my mind was mitigation trigger measures, right? I, I think we can add into whatever we're planning for, adapting to creating resilience around today. If we have things that we're monitoring for and measuring for, and we know what that trigger is that will tell us, okay, now we need to adapt or You've reached this threshold that we didn't expect this year, but it happened because we're monitoring for it. Well, that gives us the agility and flexibility to say, start programming and planning and resourcing for that because we thought it was 20 years off. Now it's 10 because climate's constantly changing and we can start resourcing for it now so that we can adapt for it before we overcome that threshold in 10 years that we thought was going to be 20. And I think that that's really key. Okay, so single highlight from the conference? I think the highlight for me was networking with people at the poster session. I've been to conferences and, and symposiums and other types of events where you might stand at a poster and nobody really comes by. There's over two posters. I can't recall exactly how many people were here, but I had a handful stop by and I had two posters, in fact. Just the way that people have been able to find me throughout the symposium, it speaks to how well it's been put on where you have maybe upwards of a thousand people here, but yet I've been able to make those connections on a one-to-one -one level many times throughout the symposium. And I, I, that's one of the things you're always going to find is that the networking is most valuable, the connections that you can make after the fact. And I'm always learning in those conversations. I've had some really challenging discussions with folks that I want to go back now to policy I'm developing or helping to develop or projects that I have on my plate and think, well, how might I take that lesson learned, that challenge, that that challenging question I got that was really food for thought? And how am I going to use that to the advantage of climate resilience in these projects that I have? Because they're from people who are outside of maybe my subject matter expertise as an environmental engineer and things that I wouldn't have considered otherwise without meeting those folks. I heard a number today that it was 1,500 that are at the event. So that's pretty impressive. That's, that's a great number for resilience being a big part of this. Okay. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah. Thank you so much, Doug. Hey, Adapters. Joining me is Dr. Janelle Sperry. Janelle is a wildlife biologist with the U.S. Army and an adjunct professor at the University of Illinois, Urbana. Hi, Janelle. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug. Thanks for having me. Could you just briefly tell us what you do with those two different institutions? Yeah. So... It, a lot of people ask, why does the Army have wildlife biologists? Well, and it's because the Army is a land manager. They manage millions of acres of land. And on that land, there are a lot of threatened, endangered species. In fact, the Army has the highest density of threatened, endangered species of any other federal land agency. And so they're required because of the Endangered Species Act to manage and conserve those species. And so my work is aimed at in improving management and conservation of threatened endangered species on military lands throughout the world. But then I'm also at the University of Illinois, the laboratory that I work at for the Army, which is the Engineer Research and Development Center. Construction Engineering Research Laboratory actually is co-located on the University of Illinois campus. And so I serve as faculty here where I advise graduate students and collaborate on a lot of the research that I do on the military lands. I wanted you to come on because the DOD symposium had so many different interesting research things going on. And some of them 
ultimately are going to be applied to adaptation. And what I wanted to talk with you about is you did a presentation on eDNA as part of a bigger panel, but you could you give us some background? What is eDNA and what are some of the applications for that? Yes, of course. I love this topic. So eDNA stands for environmental DNA. So instead of sampling for animals directly, so instead of putting out traps or using binoculars to look for bird or fishing to look for fish, instead we can just collect environmental samples where species occur and know what occurs there. And so all of us, you and I are sloughing DNA into our environments as we're going about our lives and we can collect those samples and look at what species are there. And so some examples of this are collecting water and looking at all of the aquatic species that are present in that water or collecting soil or even collecting air. And so a lot of the techniques that we use are actually very familiar to many of us now because of COVID. We use PCR. So I think a lot of people are familiar. It's just kind of in our vernacular now about detecting COVID via DNA. But instead of swabbing your nose and looking for COVID DNA, instead I collect water and look for alligator snapping turtle DNA. And it can be incredibly cost effective compared to traditional sampling methods. Okay, so tell me about some applications. You're out there doing the sampling. And I think in the presentation that you shared with me that there's some work being done in Hawaii. What's going on there? Yeah. So Hawaii, as I think a lot of people are familiar, is known as both the invasion and extinction capital of the world. We've had a very large number of extinctions, and then concurrently, we've had a large number of invasions. And so many of the species that are currently there, many of the native species, are threatened with extinction. And so one of the particularly vulnerable group are plants. Almost all of the plants out there are adapted for these pollinators that are now extinct. On the island of Oahu, for example, there's only a couple of pollinating bird species that remain on the island. And so our goal is to try to better understand what animals, both insects and birds, are visiting these plants to try to understand what species are potentially pollinating and serving this very important ecological function. The traditional way to do that would be to sit at a plant (laughs) with my binoculars and try to detect what species are visiting that plant. Or instead, we can collect the flowers, extract the DNA that's present on the flower, and be able to determine what insect and bird species were visiting that flower. So we were just out in Hawaii in May, and we visited a large number of endangered plants, including critically endangered plants, as well as invasive. We collected um, from 88 different plant species. And we were able to identify 180 species of arthropods that were using those flowers. And this was just in the sampling period, took place over a couple of weeks. So instead of sitting at those flowers for hours and hours and hours and trying to identify species, we could instead do this very concerted effort in the field and identify a very large number of species that are utilizing those flowers. Tell me why that. So this is a CERTUP hosted conference. Why are they interested in this kind of research? Because many of those plants are endangered. Yeah. So the U.S. Army Garrison, Hawaii on Oahu, they have a very extensive conservation program for the endangered species that occur on Army lands. There are actually 78 endangered plants on Oahu alone that the Army is managing. And so it's really important to understand how those plants are doing. And in this context, those critical mutualisms are just really important for um, sustaining those populations. The Army does a lot of work on propagating seeds and doing outplantings and encouraging restoration of these plants. But those restoration sites will not be successful unless we can actually have pollination and seed dispersal. And so this work in a very time efficient way can actually look at all of the species that that are serving that function by pollinating these critically endangered plants with the idea that this would improve management um, and improve conservation and then ultimately allow more flexibility in military training because we wouldn't have restrictions that can be imposed by the presence of those endangered species on military lands. When I saw you at the conference, and we're recording this after the conference, if it's not obvious already, is that I was kind of pressing you about the adaptation and planning implications of this. I'm starting to visualize more of those. And you think about, let's say, wildlife biologists, there's all this speculation that species are going to be on the move, they're going to migrate north, or the different temperatures. How do you think 
DNA could play into some of that core adaptation research that would ultimately lead to adaptation. I mean, I'm just even speculating. It's like, oh, well, we're not necessarily seeing any species, but when you're sampling, you get a lot more information. Exactly. No, it's a great question. And we're in a biodiversity crisis. We're in this mass extinction. And to be able to under... And Climate change is one of the factors that's influencing that. But to be able to actually understand the potential for adaptation in these species, we first need to understand what are the kind of climatic variables that they're currently experiencing and what is any potential for them to be able to adapt or move, for example, in the face of climate change. And that seems like a question that could be addressed, but in many cases, we don't even know the current distribution, much less understanding what potential future distribution is. When we think about some of these large charismatic species like grizzly bears or tigers, we have an idea of of where they occur, but there's thousands of species that we don't. For example, a lot of these arthropods, we don't even know their current distribution. And so they're cryptic, they're very difficult to, to survey for. So eDNA allows us to be able to survey a very large area and get a very large number of species in a relatively small amount of time and for relatively um, little money. Uh, conservation dollars, it's limited. We only have so much money to be able to address a very large number of species. So being able to use these novel and emerging tools to be able to improve survey efforts can really go a long way for being able to then predict impacts of climate change and being able to manage these species more effectively in a changing climate. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot here. When we spoke, you talked about there was some sampling going on that a species showed up in the eDNA samples, but someone was arguing that there's no possible way that this could be here. Do you remember what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. So we do get the potential So eDNA has the potential for false negatives, just like any other sampling method. The species really is there, but because of where or when we sampled, we don't detect it. And so eDNA is the same. It could be that we just happen to sample just slightly off from where that species was and we don't detect the DNA. But it's rare that we get false positives in that we say that there's a species there, even though it wasn't except for contamination. So there's the, I like to think of DNA as like glitter. It's everywhere. If you have kids, <laughs> what it's like to have glitter all over your house. And so it's very difficult to make sure that you have contamination procedures so that you don't get that glitter from one sample to another and end up with a false positive. In one case, we actually got DNA from a particular species, in this case, a fish species in a site that this fish species had never been detected there previously. And so there was concern that that was a false positive and we could not figure out why we would be getting DNA of this species. It turned out later we found out that there had been a hatchery reintroduction at this site where that particular species was found in that hatchery. We're able to detect not only the DNA of species that occur there, but DNA just from the water of a hatchery reintroduction. So it's incredibly sensitive, maybe too sensitive for detecting any indication that a species has been in that site. Just really ground truthing. That's really interesting. To wrap up here, can you give me some highlights from the conference? What, what, what were some highlights for you? I actually thought the conference was phenomenal for being able to network with other scientists and practitioners in the field. I mean, a lot of us are kind of working somewhat in isolation with our individual teams or in our individual labs or in our individual universities. And so having the opportunity to be able to interact with people that are addressing all sorts of challenges throughout DOD, throughout the U.S. was helpful both in being able to think about how it impacts our own research, but also in kind of framing what we're doing in this in this larger picture. So I thought I thought that was probably the most valuable aspect. It was a really amazing group of people all in one hotel <laughs> for the week. And people want to learn more about your research. Is it somewhat available? Can people dig into this more? Yep. So if you just Google Sperry Lab at University of Illinois, you'll see our website and all of our contact information is on there and and information about the research that we're doing. Fantastic, Janelle. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Okay. Thanks so much, Doug. Hey, actors. I'm back with Dr. Kimberly Spangler, who you heard at the beginning of the episode. Hi, Kim. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. What a great week that was. 
Yes, it was fantastic. I got to meet a ton of people. It was huge. And I'm bringing you back on and we're going to dig in a bit further into your programs there, but also talk about what happened at the conference. But first off, first impressions. I mean, you had, I think, close to 1500 people there. It was huge. We did. It was record breaking, bringing across folks from across the United States, across the globe, students, professors, industry, thought leaders, former senior level folks within the department, current senior level folks, the interagency. It was really a who's who of the environment and energy innovation space. It's a challenge for me. I go to these conferences and I want to meet as many people as possible. And this was very difficult. I really had to go out of my way. I'm Doug Parsons. I'm with America Adapt. There were so many people there, but that's a good thing to have. And all the sessions and coffee breaks were great to kind of connect with folks. But I want to go over some of the things. But what really stood out for me, and this was really an interesting thing because you had so many people there, is your poster presentations. I went to the poster presentations every night and I saw some stuff that was really cool, the diversity of what you guys are doing. But then I was going to go back the next night to talk to someone. And there was a whole new set of posters. There were that many people doing poster presentations, right? There were so many poster presentations. And what we really tried to do at those evening sessions was make it so folks could interact. We're really mindful that when we have in-person events, that we make those value-add events. We really try to keep our carbon footprint down the rest of the year, but we know that there's value to those in-person events, and we wanted to bring that. We did a survey that we just got back the results from, and the number one aspect that our attendees most enjoyed of the conference was being able to network with their fellow colleagues. But yes, complete turnover of posters every evening for three evenings. And it was a a tremendous response. I was wandering around. The diversity of projects was quite amazing. I want to talk a bit about, so the resilience was a big focus there. And I learned a ton about some of the really cool work that you guys are doing. I want to just put you thinking about this and adaptation resilience sector. It's still relatively new. A lot of people think it's been around for a while. It actually hasn't. And there's a lot of confusion on what climate resilience is. And I think people are confusing it with ESG or the sustainability sector. So how does your office acknowledge that? I mean, when I went to your resilience theme, it was pretty obvious that you guys were doing adaptation work, but you hear that from attendees or when you're out there because people are trying to make it one thing or the other, and it really isn't. I think what's really unique about the Department of Defense is we are both the supply and demand. At the end of the day, we are focused on mission, and it is very, very clear how resilience of our installations, of our power projection platforms, our force projection platforms is tied to the mission. We are mindful of the vernacular and using that appropriately, but at the end of the day, we all know that we need our forces to be able to deter conflict and fight when necessary. And in order to do that, we need to have our installations ready, be available for training, and not be impacted by extreme weather events. You touched upon this at the very beginning, explaining what your office does, but maybe you could give us a bit more detail. Is that, and we saw these in these presentations, but how does your office actually help with the transfer of technology and research developed through these programs to those relevant users out there? I mean, how does that literally kind of happen? So it's interesting. So I would say most RDT research development test and evaluation programs will frequently discuss the challenges of what they call the valley of death for tech transition. And it is real. You have to develop technology and then you need to be able to get that technology out into the field. And so we work very hard with Insert, but also in my counterpart programs, the operational energy programs to ensure that we bridge that valley of death. Two key ways that we do that is that one, when we have projects that we fund in up and ESTCP, those projects are not just monitored, but they are guided and they are shaped through frequent and mentoring type interactions with folks that are in the services, technical experts in the interagency, people from the EPA, people from the, if a technology or a capability is successful out of CERTIP and EST, it's not a surprise to anyone by the time it has matured. We work very closely with folks. We have several examples of people that we have these things called technical committees that are really, really impactful groups of folks that help shepherd these projects through. They will work with installation managers. They will have relationships with the EPA. We need to have all that infrastructure in place. 
The other thing I'll add, which I would say is relatively new in terms of its enhancement with CERTIP and ESTCP over the last two years, is our relationship with DOD and interagency policy. Many folks in the innovation space I would offer don't even really know what policy is or policy does. And while that might seem surprising, it's really just not something that's within the same space. Because of where we sit with our programs at the assistant secretary level, I have uh, personally, I think, seven, six or seven counterparts that are policy uh, directors who I speak with every single day. And we are very mindful of (laughs) the impact that we have of innovation to both support policy, but then also inform policy. Envision that a technology is developed. That technology is amazing. We get an installation to pick it up. It gets implemented there. That's great. Now, how do you get it implemented across the broad scope of DOD installations? You write that into policy. And so that's been a really amazing relationship that we have with the policy folks at this point. I think you've sort of answered this, but I, I do want to bring it up specifically in one of the presentations, and he's actually on this episode is John Conger. And I think you were there for his presentation. And there is this, I mean, I think that the Valley Death, I love these expressions, but the idea of like, there's an idea and this notion of how long it takes from being just a kernel of an idea to getting it funded as research to the point where it's actually useful to like, let's say a policymaker that might've requested in the first place. And he was throwing out numbers like six years and there are efforts underway right now to, to, to I quicken that pace, right? Yes. And so I would say having done research and development my entire career for the Department of Defense, six years is a great, it's a great achievement, but it's not great enough for how we need to be able to respond to what climate change means to our mission. And so what we've been working on, it's a very new initiative. Um, It's this National Innovation Landscape Network. Actually, John Conger challenged us with the idea of you need to get your technologies out faster. Typically, you have a two-year cycle at a minimum from the time you come up with a request for proposals to the time that you'll actually get funding out to anyone. He's like, too slow. We agree with that. There's, there are reasons that we do things that way so that there's a two-year cycle. But when you look at good portfolio management, we don't need to do that across the entirety of the portfolio. And so one way that we are doing that, and we're taking a little bit more risk, but it's a calculated risk, is with these national innovation landscape networks. And so it's a regional approach. And what's really key about it is that the innovators are working hand in hand with the user community. So the folks that are on the installations, they are out there solving problems in real time, exchanging information in real time. And that is allowing the research and development projects that we're working on to evolve to best meet the user needs in real time. So normally it's a two-year cycle for us to put a request for proposal together and get it out. We came up with this idea, I think it was in June. By August, we had released a solicitation and we have already accepted proposals on it now in December. So orders of magnitude improvements on our timing just on the selection process. And then we're expecting to see real transitions within the next year or two. I think it's because it's the orbits that I run in. But as I was walking around, seeing the different poster presentations, you you guys partner and I guess fund so many academics, graduate students, private companies doing an incredibly diverse amount of work out there. Are there opportunities for external organizations or researchers to collaborate with your offices? I mean, how does that process work? Yes. And that is why we are successful is based on the folks that we work with. So quite truly, America is a nation of innovators. People like innovation. Innovation is fun. Innovation gives people hope. These are really what could be intractable problems. And we need the innovators of this country and also globally to help us solve these challenges. And so we put out calls for proposals not just annually, but now at different time frames throughout the year. And we have the ability to fund industry, academia, federal labs, DOD labs. There, there's very few constraints on who we can fund. And I'll add, when we fund folks, we are not just sending money out, hoping for the best and hoping that at the end of the project, we'll get a product. 
The folks that are funded on our programs get to work hand in hand with the nation's experts from both the innovation side and the user community to shape their projects as it goes through. So it is a really unique process, something that Certip and ESTCP have been doing for about three decades. And I would offer that these two programs have one of the best track records of S&T technology development. And it's because of the processes that we have in place by working with these different folks. I, I keep going back to all these projects that you guys have funded or funding or going to fund. And for you, even at the head of the the offices, they're keeping track of these things. Is there like a database? And I realize this Department of Defense. I'm sure some things are just... Uh, considered secret information or national security inf information, but it, it, are there ways for external partners to say, well, gosh, there's all this great research out there that our local communities might be able to benefit from kind of secondhand. Is that a, something that happens? Correct. So one way that's uh, very easy, as long as you have a computer or a smartphone, is go to certip-estcp.mil. That is our website. Our website has is actually built on a database framework and you can see all of the projects that we have funded for at least the last 10 years. And when you click on each of those projects, which is very searchable with a Google search function, we have final reports that are published there. We have links to publications. We have links to interim reports. It's a very passive way to get information. Beyond that, I would I always offer to folks that the best way to meet people within the program and that are funded by the program is to actually attend the symposium. And we also have opportunities throughout the year where we have strategic workshops, we go out to the field. We have a huge network. And so it's pretty easy within one or two degrees of separation, I would say, in this research and innovation space that you would end up with knowing someone that's either currently or formally funded by CERTIP and ESCCP. Well, I would love to encourage you to send someone from your office to the National Adaptation Forum. It happens every two years, and it's obviously this big adaptation themed conference. And I think they'd really benefit because what's really not happening out there very well, and it's not, it's no one's fault, but you think of a local community, they don't actually have the luxury of thing. What are our research needs? So they might do a vulnerability assessment and they think, oh, what we need to adapt to extreme heat. But that sort of process of really understanding what their adaptation research needs are, they just don't have the luxury of it. And just looking even at that model, I think would be useful what you guys have come up with. And so anyway, just encourage you guys to, to get out there where you can beyond people coming to your events too, because that aspect of it is really missing right now in the adaptation planning. Yes, we'll definitely take that recommendation. Could you give me some of your own personal highlights from the conference? The things that I was most excited about seeing at the conference was the innovative network of diverse folks that we have working on DOD. Like I, I had mentioned before, folks from all different aspects of their schooling or their career, early career, mid-career, late career, the active mentorship that was happening at that conference, just the exchange of ideas. So that to me was most inspiring. I was also thrilled to see that we had interest from members of the media. We think it's very critical that we share the amazing work that we're doing within the DOD to take on these challenges. Information is power, and, and we love to get that out there, again, so we can make sure that we're working with our best innovators and also certainly understand the challenges that folks are facing. And I, I really did love seeing our morning breakfast plenary sessions where we saw just a diverse swath of work that we're funding with CERTIP, ESCC, and the Operational Energy Programs get to brief their work and just have folks be excited about it. Fantastic. And so can you give us a preview of next year? This is like a symposium that you do every year. I'm assuming that resilience and adaptation will continue to be on, on a theme for you guys. It'll continue to be a theme for us. We will have this conference next year. We will be partnering with our operational energy counterparts again will be in a larger space in downtown DC and certainly just encourage as many folks to come as possible. We loved having everyone there. All right. Fantastic. Kim, thanks for coming on the podcast and thanks for partnering with America Adapts. It is our greatest pleasure and can't wait for the episode.
Okay, Adapters, that is a wrap. First off, thanks to Kim for inviting me to cover the symposium. It was eye-opening and certainly an honor to cover one of the premier climate resilience events in the country. And as you heard, it will be an annual occurrence. As my regular listeners know, I'm a strong advocate for fostering the growth of the adaptation sector. I encourage my listeners who are interested in learning what resilience research is underway, attend the next 2024 symposium. You might not be partnering directly with the DOD, but there's much to learn. As you heard over and over again in this episode, the poster presentations covered a ton of ground, and the DoD is also interested in funding innovative projects that will obviously enhance their mission. But as you learn, there are many civilian applications to the work they do. Very exciting times in the adaptation space. And thanks to all the experts who participated in this episode. I have links in my show notes to them and many of their programs. Definitely check them out. And it was very cool to reconnect with my old graduate school colleague, Kevin Hires. As you can see, he's out there doing great things. I hope to cover next year's conference and maybe I'll see you guys there. Lastly, I want to express my gratitude to the U.S. Department of Defense and Kimberly's team for extending an invitation and facilitating my participation in the symposium. It was a fantastic opportunity and it's a privilege to be working with the U.S. Department of Defense. Okay, so as I mentioned in the introduction, this is my 200th episode of America Adapts. I started this podcast seven years ago to keep my mind sharp on adaptation as I was between jobs, but it quickly turned into something much bigger for me. I've been able to interview some of the most interesting, accomplished, and inspirational people in the world on the podcast. It has taken me all over the world, and I've learned what adaptation means outside the United States. I've been doing adaptation for 20 years, but it's truly astonishing to see how the field has grown and evolved in the last seven years that I've been doing the podcast. I've been committed to focusing on the adaptation sector, but I do enjoy on occasion covering other topics like climate fiction, the media, and occasionally cool climate books. I do like to mix things up a bit. But I am committed to this topic, and I guess, unfortunately, it will only become more important in the years ahead, and there are many lessons and stories to be shared. We'll be doing climate adaptation for generations, and I feel privileged to be able to share the work of some of the leading thinkers in this emerging field. For those who are interested in getting into the adaptation space, take a dive into my episode archive. We've covered a lot of ground. Please reach out if you have ideas for content or guests, and also just to let me know your role in the adaptation universe. I also want to thank some of my early supporters. The podcast wouldn't exist if they weren't providing encouragement and support. Special thanks to Dr. Jesse Keenan, who's been there listening and contributing since the very beginning. Thanks to Sean Martin and Anita Van Breda at World Wildlife Fund for their ongoing sponsorship of the podcast and their friendship and their blunt advice. Thanks to Dan Ackerstein and all his writing input. Thanks to Lindsay Parsons for supporting the family during the very lean years. And thanks to Lisa Craig and her partnerships. Thanks to Rob Moore at NRDC for being a regular sponsor and an avid cheerleader of the pod. Thanks to Dr. Carolyn Kuski of Environmental Defense Fund for also having the imagination to use a podcast to share adaptation content. Special shout out to Don in Canada, who's been a regular listener and regular cheerleader. And a deep thank you to all of you who donate to America Daps. Your financial support is critical. Thank you for making that effort. And finally, thanks to all my listeners. I've heard from many of you over the years and it's always a treat to hear from you and learn what your favorite episodes are, what episodes frustrated you, what you do for a living. It's all gold. Please do keep reaching out. Okay, here's to the next 100 episodes. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.